morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McCleary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Thank you all for your ongoing viewership and support. We couldn't do this without you. And please stay tuned to the end of this program today, and I'll give you just a brief update on some terrific upcoming programs. For those of you who are not yet members of the World Affairs Council Town Hall, it's a great way to support our organization and it has, it comes, the memberships come with some terrific benefits. So please go to our website at lawacth.org and find out about becoming a member today. For those of you who would like to ask questions of our panelists, there's a control panel on the right hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program that will start in about 30, 35 minutes. It's now my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Power for all, how it really works and why it's everyone's business. We are joined by co-author Julie Batalana. Dr. Batalana is Professor of Organizational Behavior and Social Innovation at the Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School, where she is also founder and faculty chair of the Social Innovation and Change Initiative. We are also pleased to welcome Tope Ogadepe, excuse me, Tope, who is joining us today from Lagos, Nigeria. Tope was featured in the Power for All book. Last year, she founded her cons consultancy, Tech Societal, which specializes in public pol policy processes for internet rights and freedoms. Moderating today's conversation is Kimberly Freeman, Associate Dean and Chief Diversity Officer for the USC Dana and David Dornside College of Letters, Arts, and Scientists. Sciences. Dr. Freeman, I'm so happy that you're moderating today's program. Let me bring you on with our distinguished panelists. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you for that warm introduction. It's truly an honor to be in conversation with these women today um, to hear about their uh, views on power. And I want to start by uh, speaking with the co-author of the book, uh, Professor Batalana. I'd like to ask you, what is power? Hi, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. And it's a pleasure to join you today and to also uh, have this opportunity to join with Topic. So what is power? Uh, that, that's a big and critical question. And what's, uh, uh, what Tiziana Kasharu, my co-author on, on this book and myself have come to realize is that although power is probably one of the most talked about topics, it also happens to be one of the most misunderstood topics. And so in our work, uh, teaching about power, researching about the politics of change in organizations and in society and advising change makers across the globe, We've had this amazing opportunity to work with people from all walks of life with very different trajectories. But what we've come to realize is that a lot of these people have deep misconceptions in mind about power that prevent them from understanding it. And so what we do in the book is that we provide the fundamentals of power. So what is power? Power is the ability to influence other people's behavior. Right? That, that's a definition, but that's not an explanation. And the question becomes, but then where does that ability come from? And this is what we refer to in the book as the fundamentals of power. Power resides in control over access to valued resources. I have power over you, Kimberly, if I control access to resources that you value. And you have power over me if you control access to resources that I value. It could be that you're connected to someone with whom I have to connect because they have the expertise I need for the project I'm working on. And if you are one of the few people I know connected to that person, then you, you have some power over me. Now, we human beings do value money and material possessions, but that, that's not the only kind of resource we actually value. We also value psychological resources such as affiliation, such as morality, 
Uh, and so as we think about control over valued resources, do not think only about material resources and money, also think about those other psychological resources that can be a source of power. Think about MLK, think about Mandela, more recently Malala Yousafzai, Greta Thunberg. What is it that they've been doing? They've inspired us because they're standing for moral values that we want to be associated with. And that also gives them some power over us. Wow. Well, what an opening. And I think we are going to explore a lot of the themes that you just expressed in the definition of power. I'd like to invite uh, Tope to the conversation. Um, Tope, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. So um, in the book, Julie talks about uh, power being a relationship. And I understand the two of you have a relationship from some work that you've done at Harvard. Um, talk a little bit about the work that you did um, in Nigeria um, when it came to uh, freedom of expression online. Um, this is talked about in the book, but it would be great to use this as an example in our conversation today. Um, thank you, Kimberly. So um, I was uh, working at the time with um, a social enterprise called Paradigm Initiative. And this social enterprise was very focused on issues of freedom of expression online, more broadly human rights in the digital space. Um, and I should let you know, Kimberly, that I, I haven't always felt powerful in this position. And I remember that this is um, one of the conversations that I had with uh, Julie when I met her. Um, I, 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 grew, I grew in a culture that is deeply patriarchal um, girls are raised um, not to have a voice, literally. So you do not you do not talk back. You do not look someone in the eye when they speak to you. Otherwise, you would not grow to be a good wife. Um, these were these were some demons that I was fighting in the, in the leadership position that I was in at the time when I started to work with Paradigm. At a time when I had a responsibility um, to lead our teams in 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 a wide range of advocacy activities, including direct lobbying with um, older men, powerful men um, in the Nigerian parliament at the time. Um, she, she mentioned, you know, the case of the of the of the frivolous petitions bill. Um, it was it was nicknamed the social media bill in Nigeria at the time. It was a bill. It was an executive bill that was introduced into the House. Sorry, not an executive bill. It was a private member bill. It was introduced by a powerful senator. And you know, um, this was a bill that proposed um, up to seven years sentence, twenty-five thousand dollar fine for what was um, what was described as abusive message. You know, a insightful message, message that incite, you know, um, like um, expressions that would incite the public against the government. That sort of thing, propagation of uh, false information. And you know, um, like I was saying to you at the time that this bill was um, was proposed, it was a rude awakening because we had just transitioned into a new government in Nigeria. We were in the euphoria of we have done something really nice. You know, it was the same social media and the the mobilization of social media that helped with voting out the governments that people were dissatisfied in and then voting in this government. And then a few months later, this same government went after the social media, literally. So it was a really rude awakening. Um, um, but in terms of what I did immediately, I think for a moment, I was looking also to, um, to Benga, who is the founder and, and the partner at the time to do something because I, I will be in meetings. I tell you what was happening the entire eight years I was in this organization. I will attend meetings and people would ask me, where's Benga? Um, why, you know, it was literally like, why is he not here? What, why are you here? You know, is the one who gets to make the decisions. It was the one who was seen as the powerful person, as the great person, as the social justice icon. And I was seen, even though I was the chief operating officer and we're literally partners in making these decisions, I was often seen as the personal assistant. How can we get a conversation with him? When is he going to show up? You know, and what those things did for me, you know, did to me was that it took me time, you know, before I started to understand my own, my own skills, my own expertise, my own edge, what I was contributing, the value that I was adding. And it was around this time that I started to um, say to my team, how, how, do we, how do we have 
um, some sort of plan that anyone in the organization, not just being there and I can go to, if something happens in our space in Nigeria and as an organization, we need to respond and we need to push back. What do we do? What system do we put in place that this power doesn't reside with Benga or with me, but anyone can pick this up, you know, as a system and respond and it works in terms of pushing back against you know um overreach of government or any other entities on human rights on the internet thank you and i heard a lot in what you just said and it really relates to some things that i've um, been reading about in the book so julie how does one um, who feels powerless begin to feel powerful so thank you and thank you to Tope for sharing with us in such a transparent way right in such a candid way what she went through like how she felt how she went from feeling powerless to building the power base that she needed to then have more impact within an or her organization and outside because let's not forget that in her case she was building the power internally and externally to be able to shape the policies and and protect people human rights online so it, it is truly remarkable so a, we first have to acknowledge that you know once we understand the fundamentals of power, that power is about control over access to valued resources, then the beauty of it is that you also get to understand there's always something you can do to gain a measure of power. What you may have to do to gain a measure of power is convince the other party that what you have to offer is more important to them than what they thought. That's what marketing professionals do all the time. They convince us that we need this car, that we need this product, but do we, you know, like, but we, we come to be convinced by them. So that's something we can all do. We can attract people to us. The other thing you can try and do is limit the number of options that uh, the other party has to access the resources that you have to offer. This is what companies do on markets. Think about monopolies or quasi monopolies. We have a number of those around us in the tech industry at the moment. But this is not only happening for companies. When workers get together as part of unions, this is what they do too. This is the kind of consolidation strategy they use to rebalance power with their employers. Now, there are other things you can do to try and reduce the power that the other party has over you. What can you do? You can try and turn your back and say, you know what? Yes, I needed those resources you had to offer for some time, but maybe I don't anymore. Think about you in relationship to your employers. It could be that, yes, you wanted that job for a long time, but maybe now you don't want it anymore. You're turning your back. You know, the, the, the power relationships are just in such a way rebalanced. And then there's a fourth thing you can do to try and reduce the power that someone, another party would have over you or another organization, which is to then be thinking about alternative channels you have to access the resources that they have and that you need, right? Like think about it again in the context of your company, your organization, uh, maybe you want to pay raise. And so maybe you're going to go and apply for other jobs and come to the table with alternative offers so that you can tell your boss, well, you know, here it is. Like I'd like to get this pay raise and this, these are the options I have at other organizations that have that conversation. Now, Kimberly, based on what Tope said, I think if I stopped there, I would be foolish because I would just say, Think about the fundamentals, and then you'll see there's always something you can do. But what Tope just reminded all of us of is that we are not all equal. The truth is that there are power hierarchies. There are accepted orders of you know, who has most, more versus less power in society. And these power hierarchies vary across countries, across regions, but some of them have been quite deeply entrenched and rooted for quite a long time. You know, we were just talking about patriarchal system and a situation in which, for example, women have been dominated. We could also talk about systemic racism and a number of other highly problematic power hierarchies. So the truth is that the fundamentals of power apply to everyone, but some of us are enabled by the existing hierarchies and some of us are constrained. And that's exactly what Tope was talking about. But then the question becomes, if you're constrained, what can you still do? And, and Tope is a living example that there are in fact many things you can do. A, first, understand power. Become a student of power so that it's not this dirty thing for you anymore, it's this thing that's not for you. It's something that you can harness and use as a force for good. And then learn how to map the power relationships in your organizations, in society, because then you can start thinking about how you can shift the balance of power. And importantly, you may not be able to do much alone, but I'm going back to what Tope said. She said, you know what, at some point I got to understand that 
people were not thinking of me as a powerful person. But she also realized she could do a lot within our organization to work collectively to change the balance of power, to make people understand they needed the systems so that other people and not only the iconic CEO could actually have impact. And so that kind of collective action within an organization and at the societal level makes a hell of a difference. We cannot do much by ourselves, but together we can change the system. We can disrupt the utterly unjust power hierarchies. And we know that from history, we know that from our experience and we know that from research. That was a wonderful example that Tope gave because she also um, illustrated the importance of distributing power across an organization. And one of the things that I, um, you know, that kind of um, sparked an interest in me while I was reading the book was about um, these levels and layers of power, um, individual, organizational, and societal. Um, why do you think as um, individuals, we focus on, I would say, um, the negative with when it comes to power? You hear a lot of people saying they don't want to be in these uh, power roles or be power brokers because they see it as negative. What, what has, I guess, caused that view of power to be negative? That question's for you, Julie. Okay, so I was about to say we should hear from Tope if she had that kind of experience too. So, so I'll tell you, the truth is that think about historical examples. Think about people surrounding us. Think about what the, the media across the world is sort of, you know, the, the, are highlighting as these are the problematic issues. Look at how people have been using their power. This is this association between power and dirtiness. That's kind of a, in, on everyone's mind. Whenever I, I teach about power or discuss power with groups across the world, I always ask people to tell me what words come to their mind when they think about power. And invariably, <laughs> they say dirty, they say abuse. You know, like these, these things come to mind because we've seen them in history and we see them around us today. And we human beings tend to remember the negatives more than we do the positives in many situations. So then we're sort of thinking power is always dirty. Now, I'll tell you that this is one of the main misconceptions that Tiziana and I have identified about power. And I've come to worry a lot about this misconception because a lot of people would come to me and tell me, you know what, Julie, power is not for me. I'm not one of the people at the top. I don't have the personal characteristics that I think these people have, uh, but good for me because at least I'm not getting my hands dirty. But here is why it's so dangerous and I worry so much about it, because if people disengage from power, then they let those who already have power gain ever more power. And this is when the dangers of power abuse are so much more salient. And, and this is exactly what Tope is fighting in the work she is doing and she's been doing uh, for, 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 for some time now. And this is why this work is so critically important. So it is absolutely critical to realize that yes, power can be dirty. And we do know from experience, from history and from research in social psychology, that power tends to change human psychology. And it has two pernicious effects. Power tends to make us more self-centered and it also tends to make us more hubristic, arrogant, right? And, and, and overconfident. This is the reality and no one is immune to that. In the book, we talk about the example of Vera Cordero, another amazing social entrepreneur who I know Tope knows in Brazil, a pediatrician who has dedicated her life to saving kids uh, who live in the poorest uh, areas and communities in Brazil and don't have access to healthcare. Even this woman came to us and told us about experiencing the dangers of hubris. And, and what power can do to you. But what she, Vera, has been able to do is she's been able to uh, find antidotes to the poisons of power. And we know that they exist. And this is what I want to put emphasis on. How can you counter hubris? You need to cultivate humility. How can you counter self-centeredness? You need to cultivate empathy. So it's to each and every one of us. Again, we're not immune to any of the dangers of abusing power. But power is not dirty, and dirtiness is in us. And we have to cultivate humility. We have to cultivate empathy if we want to make sure we don't abuse our power. And then I want to turn to, to, to Tope, but I'll just say this is not enough because you cannot trust human beings. You know, even the people who are driven by the common good at different moments in time may lose it, as Vera reported to us, right? So, what is it that we need to do? 
you need to also have checks on power. You need to make sure that the checks on power within organization, within democracies are in place and that they are respected. And this is why civic vigilance is so critical. And this is why the work of Tope is so fundamental to the well-being and the enhancement of democracy. That's awesome. And I do want to bring Tope into this conversation because you actually lived these examples that Julie just gave. And um, I guess what I'm thinking now is what was going through your mind when you were organizing and doing this work? Um, were you having some of these, um, you know, moments of uh, where you might have been more self-centered or you needed to rebalance um, your own thoughts around power? And then the follow-up question would be, because um, I think this goes to the question of um, checks and balances, when did you know you needed to move your strategy from online to you know out in the public square and actually do this campaign to overthrow this uh, this law? Um, thank you for those questions, Kimberly. So um, at the time when we were organizing, I would um, say that I wasn't thinking very much about my relationship to power, to be honest. Um, but I would say more generally, I have always also had the view that power is dirty. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up in a country where we had years and years of military, um, military um, government, if you can put it that way, or junta. So I saw uh, what power does when it's absolutely unchecked, you know. So, um, yeah, so I grew up with that paradigm. Um, Nigeria returned to democratic government only in 1999. It's not even up to 30 years. It's been, it's this, there, have, there have been several ECOPs along the way. Um, and, and also, you know, taking my history and context, you know, like I described, you see power as a dirty thing, you know, this thing that when people have, they oppress other people. Um, so it wasn't something that I thought I wanted. I just wanted to help people. I just wanted to be the voice that others did not have because I know what it feels like to be voiceless. Um, but I think that I started to understand along the way that um, even if I wasn't acknowledging it, I had power. Um, I had power because I'd had opportunities that others did not have. Um, I, I had power because I have certain skills, certain, certain, certain qualities, certain attributes. I, I had it, you know, and um, it, it was now a question of what do you do with it? What, what, you know, what are you going to do with what you have? Um, and, and at various moments in my career, um, maybe not necessarily in 2015, but after success, you know, after, after the bill is thrown out, there, there's a certain way you feel when all the news outlets starts to report, all oh, the scenes are thrown out this bill, you know, it's been struck out, Nigerians have won. Um, there's a certain feeling you start to have, you know, afterwards, like from then on, whenever you have success and as you have increasing success. And that's where, you know, what Julie was saying about character becomes really very important. You have to absolutely always remind yourself about why you are doing what you were doing. You know, I have something I say to myself all, all the time. It's not about you and it's not about. So and that really helps me. Even when I'm feeling powerless, that really helps me. It, prob it probably helps more when I'm feeling powerless to remind myself that it is not about you. It is not about if you feel comfortable, if it is not about if you feel like you can do this or uh, you just have a responsibility and you have to stand up to that responsibility and do it. Um, for the sake of others. And then to the second question around um, how we move to the campaign from online to the offline space. I think that the main strategy behind that campaign was to give Nigerians something to do with the knowledge that we're providing to them. So it wasn't just um, we, were, we were giving them all this information about the bill and how it was progressing in the Senate and what it meant for their freedoms um, you know, what it meant for, for human rights. It wasn't just that. It was that you can do something about it. It was that this is not the responsibility of paradigm initiative. This is not the responsibility of some advocate or activist somewhere. This is not, um, you, you don't, this is not something you seed to others to do for you. You know, this is, this is your power. This is your voice. This is your vote. 
And you know, we, we, were, we were actually telling people if your senators vote or representatives vote in favor of this bill, then you need to recall them. A lot of people did not even know that they could take that action at the time, you know, that they, they had the power to recall their representatives. So it was about giving them what to do and organizing those movements and saying that on this day, by this time, is when the public hearing is going to be going on at the Senate. So we want all of you to be there with placards. We want you to disrupt you know, that meeting. We want them to feel your voice and your presence. And people felt powerful in doing that. People felt like I am not helpless in the face of you know, this thing that I don't want that my government is doing. I can do something. So I think that um, that's the main strategy um, you know, that we had in terms of moving um, the campaign offline. It was about like, what's the action that you need to take? What is that thing that you need to do? How do you mobilize? How do you, you know, how do you, how do you move against this thing in your own space in a way that is effective, you know, and then you can measure the results of, of, of what you are doing. And, and uh, we had success as Nigerians. It wasn't a success of Paradigm Initiative. Everyone felt powerful. And I think that that's the, that's the beauty. You will go on the streets, you will talk to people who, who possibly were not on the streets protesting, but everyone felt powerful. Everyone felt like this was our, this was our thing. You know, it's not the paradigm thing. It was, it, was, um, it was the moments that every Nigerian, you know, fought for and, and, and took back their rights. That is wonderful. Um, so it sounds like the citizens felt ownership and felt that they had a stake in the outcome and that's really um brought up the, the examples in the book also bring up that point as well i want to just follow up with you because you talked about paradigm and i understand that you left in uh, 2019 and formed your own company um, so can you talk a little bit more about the work you're doing today and maybe some examples of how you're using power in your current job so um I i'm still doing um I'm still doing something really similar to what I was doing at Paradigm, but um, I'm kind of targeting organizations, um, it, um, or would I say um, decision makers who ordinarily will not think about people who are vulnerable and have no voice in the decisions that they are making. So, for instance, an international aid organization will decide that in so and so countries we are going to roll out these digital access programs. But they are completely blindsided about, um, you know, about how um, how men and women have access to digital technologies, you know, in different ways. Um, you know, they are completely blindsided about the social inclusion issues. Um, you know, so and they are making these decisions broadly, and they think they are helping, but they are completely leaving out a a, a whole section of society sometimes. So. Um, so what I do now is some sort of a consulting with these types of uh, international aid organizations, with um, global companies, um, internet, you know, global companies that are building products for our society that have millions, sometimes billions of people using their product, and they are making, they are developing policies for how people, for instance, are using their product, but they do not understand, you know, um, for instance. Um, that they are not representing enough um, the the issues that affect women or uh, indigenous people or religious minorities. You know, they, there's, they are developing this 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 policies and these products, but there's a whole segment of society that they are completely overlooking and not including their voices in how these products and policies are developing. Um, so, for instance, one of the projects I'm doing is with the Digital Access Program of the UK government, for instance, um, they have the cybersecurity um, project um, within that Digital Access Program that they are rolling out in five partner countries. And as they are coming up with this, with this program, I'm looking at the angle of digital rights, how digital rights are impacted, you know, um, within these programs. I'm looking at how gender is being mainstreamed within these programs. I'm looking at social inclusion issues within this program. So um, that's the new exciting thing that I'm doing. Um, it's a bit different from street activism, and I miss that a bit. And you know, I'm still with the communities that we built at the time, and I still mobilize, I still add my voice, I still add my expertise, but this is this new exciting thing 
you know, that I'm helping um, big firms, you know, and global organizations to be able to, you know, as they make decisions, look deeper within society and include every voice. Well, it sure sounds like you're using power as a um, energy and force for good. So um, that is one of the key messages in the book as well. Um, I want to go back to you, Julie, and we talked a little bit about the relationship between power and some of these diversity, equity, and inclusion issues that Tope just mentioned in terms of the work that her new firm is doing. Why is it important for um, particularly um, minoritized or underrepresented um, people with, you know, um, less access to power, why is it important for them to understand some of the concepts that you are uh, illustrating in this book at this moment in time? Well, at this moment in time, it is absolutely critical because we are, we are all now in a fight, right, against sexism, racism, uh, and other forms of discrimination. Um, think about what has happened uh, in, in this country and across the world over right, the, the past few years, the Me Too movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and I'm thinking about what Tope just described about the, the, the incredible work she's been doing as a social change maker on the ground. If right, you think about these movements, what these movements have done is that they have not only agitated against the status quo, which as we explain in the book is something that has to happen for a movement to be effective, but they went beyond agitation, which is exactly what Tope has been doing with her work as well. They also have innovated and orchestrated. They have proposed alternative ways of organizing so that we can really redistribute access to resources in a fairer way. And then as Tope mentioned, they've also orchestrated, it's all the organizing that she's been talking about. If we really want to change the distribution of power in society, then we need to work together and we need to make sure that on the ground we push for the control of our access to resources to, to actually happen in a different way, just to break with the norms and the traditions that we are all so used and that we have all internalized. So it is a critical time now for people, especially those who've been excluded from power, to engage with power and understand it, understand the fundamentals so that you get to understand what you can do by yourself, how you can build your own power base, but importantly, how we can work together in organizations and in society to make change happen. One of the examples we give in the book that will probably resonate with some of the people in the audience is the example of a, a given organization, the Johnson Space Center. You know, it is the center where American astronauts go to train. And uh, we give the example of Ellen Oshua, who some of you may know. Ellen Oshua was the first American Latina astronaut to go to space. And she became the head later in her career of the Johnson Space Center. And when she became the head of the center, she started with a clear vision of what she wanted to achieve. She wanted to make that center truly more inclusive. Right? Now, she also knew that one of diversity programs would not be enough. She also knew that just promoting a few people from these minoritized groups wouldn't be enough. Right? We know about all of the issues with tokenism that's been documented in research, I see that in my own research as well. She knew that what was needed was a cultural change. And importantly, she understood, and that's related to the fundamentals of power, that if she really wanted to empower people, then she had to make sure that people who never controlled access to valued resources would actually control access to valued resources. So how do you do that in your organization? Well, you have to be systematic. She created a committee. The committee was in charge of screening all the processes and systems, formal and informal ones, which I know, Kimberly, is what you do and you know so well, right? And then going through all of this in detail, kind of saying, how is that affecting the distribution of resources? Is this fair? Is this not? Those are difficult questions, but questions that we have to handle and tackle collectively within our organizations and within society. Interestingly, what Ellen realized is that the informal opportunities were critical. Because at the Johnson Space Center, on certain days, very well-known people would come, members from the government, uh, NBA stars, you know, like actors, actresses, you name them. And then the question became, who's going to give them a tour of the center today? And people were unconsciously always going to the same people because these people did well in the past, so why not have them do that? 
except that these people kept doing it and get access to, to more people, to more resources, and others never had those opportunities. So Ellen created a program so that we would make sure that all those informal opportunities would be more fairly distributed and that people would know they could and should be raising their hands because even though they didn't have these opportunities before, they were actually open to them. And she went one step further. She made uh, the inclusion practices part of the whole evaluation process internally so that everyone from top managers to manager to frontline workers would get to understand that this was something truly valued in the organization that would be part of their performance appraisal. So I think it's an example that shows that there are things we can do, but it is critical for that to happen that we all understand the fundamentals of power so that we stop thinking that one of interventions will be enough. It's about redistributing access to valued resources. Thank you. And I think we've hit the mark at which um, we're now going to entertain questions from our audience. So Jessica, my understanding is you'll be um, moderating this portion. And so thank you both and I'll see you in a bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Freeman. Uh, to our audience, before we start the questions, we just want to thank you again for your continued support of our programs. Um, as you know, we are not going to be able to return to in-person events for a little bit longer due to the Delta variant and that uh, limits our ability to uh, provide event income. So we are really, really grateful for any donations you can make or to renew your membership. Um, if you're able to do that, please visit our website at lawacth.org and click on the donate button or make a donation um, or become a member. We greatly appreciate it. All right, to hop over to the questions. Uh, the first one, there is cultural power, financial power, moral high ground power, power of the law, power of fear and power of science. But are either of you familiar with the power of time? I don't know which of you wants to take so, that. So, <laughs> so, so I, can, I, I, can, I can get started. I'm going to, to, to go back to what I was describing is about, you know, power resides in control over access to valued resources. So you could say that we now live in a world in which, you know, like what, what we all lack is time and time is one of the most valued resources. So, so to a certain extent, you know, like having control over your own time, other people's time, like it, it is absolutely a, a source of power. And actually it's one of the reasons why sometimes people feel powerless because what if you do not control even your own time? What if you're in a job where your manager is not giving you the autonomy, right? That, that's highly problematic. By the way, we know from research that when you work with managers who give you that autonomy, then you know the people, the, the employees are happier, they perform at a higher level, uh, and this is a, a, a positive virtuous circle. But interestingly, many people wrongly assume that they shouldn't give that autonomy to people, and, and, and that's the wrong decision to make. You should absolutely give that autonomy and that trust because that's going to help you enable and empower people to do their, their, their best work. So yes, uh, time you know, can be a very valued resource, and control over time can be a critically important source of power. Thank you. Um, for Tope, what would you recommend to others who want to lead change and best manage power in very challenging environments? Um, so, so it depends on um, the nuances within the environment. You know, um, that's a very broad and general question. For instance, there was a time when I was training coalitions in Francophone countries in Africa, and they have a very different system of government than um, what we have in West Africa. It's supposed to be a democracy, but it's a very dangerous one. People disappear and no one asks questions. And so we did not train the people to go on the streets like we would. Um, I think that in that kind of situation, what we advised was um, they should find champions within government and you know um, go towards um, what you know kind of like providing support and expertise capacity building to government officials um, in the areas where they wanted to see change we did not advise that they be very adversarial like you know like we were doing in in our context in nigeria and some other west african countries we thought it was best if they approached this um this um government agencies or politicians and 
you know, they, they, they put a face to the name and they described the kind of value that they were able to bring to their ministries, their agencies, the work that they were doing, whether that was in terms of participating in consultations, drafting of bills, um, capacity building for staff and things like that. So um, I, I would really say it depends on the context, but, um, you know, what I would advise generally is no matter how difficult um, the circumstance, there, there, are, there are ways um, to you know to have that exchange where you're able to you're able to um, um, offer what you have you know for what you need um, and it, it just depends on how it is it can be crafted differently um, for instance in our context the government needed to be in the good books of citizens in the other context where, where I was making reference to they needed certain type of expertise that was absent from government. Um, you know, and then the civil society, they were able to provide these types of expertise. And then in providing these ex types of expertise, they were then able to push their positions forward, you know, in, in those dialogues and conversations. So, yes, I would say that um, um, there are differences in, in context and there are nuances, but, you know, it's always possible um, to be able to offer value and to be able to shift things um, to, to, to what you would, to the, to the side of the change that you would like to see um, to one degree or other. Thank you. Um, Julie, can you talk about what you've observed regarding power dynamics shifting during COVID, specifically with parents being home more and having to take on more of a role as parent, worker, educator, and pandemic navigator for their children? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the, the pandemic has uh, uh, certainly led to a number of shifts. Now, the, you could say it's almost early to say, you know, like, are these shifts going to be sustained and where are we really? So I would say that the crisis we've been facing has not only been a health crisis, but it's also been a social and economic crisis characterized by rising inequalities on top of an environmental crisis that has been ongoing for a long time. Right? And so there are a few things we know. If you were to ask me and you ask, well, you know, where, what are the roots of, of these multiple crises? I would say that I would say that they can tr be traced back to neoliberalism, a doctrine that has focused all of our energy and, and attention on maximizing financial value and maximizing profit only. And what we do know now from research in sociology and economics is that if we stay the course, we know what's going to happen. We're going to further increase inequalities and further destroy the planet. And if you think about what has happened during the pandemic, the truth is that the pandemic has further increased the inequalities. Right? Uh, the population that were marginalized have been struggling much more. Right? Uh, look at life expectancy. It's dropped by one year, you could say. Like, you know, this, is, this is what we see across the population. But if you look at racialized groups, we're talking about drops that are different from two to three years. Right, in the African-American community in this country, for example. So uh, inequalities have increased. Uh, the, the, the truth, though, is that the situation has been more complicated for all workers throughout the pandemic, uh, especially you know, for families with young kids and especially family with families with young kids that didn't have a whole support system and were not supposed to get the help. Think about monoparental families as well. Uh, that, that the situation has been even more complicated for them. And, and again, like quite often what you get to see in the statistics is that uh, you, you have a combination of, you know, people who belong to racialized groups who are, you know, like in monoparental families who do not have access to resources. These people have been struggling more and I are still struggling more. And, and so when we're seeing that, you know, that there is growth and then people can find jobs again, you know, yes, this is true for some people, but this is less true for other categories of population. So I would say all in all, the pandemic has made the inequalities even more salient. I should also be talking about women. Women have been leaving the workforce much more than men. And we also have all the data from all the, the different countries now showing that they've been in charge of most of the domestic chores and in charge of the kids much more than men have been during the pandemic, which has made it really complicated for women to continue to have a professional career. Uh, and, and with millions of them now being out of the workforce, it's a question of what's going to happen next. And we have to be thinking about how we are going to support them, give them access to valued resources so that they can be back 
and, and, and they can have the kind of impact that they aspire to for those who want to be back and that they can continue to do what they do at home and be valued for what they do for those who really want to stay at home. But so bottom line to me is uh, the pandemic has made inequalities even more salient. And it is critical that we now tackle these inequalities at home, within our organizations, and in society. At the societal level, listen, over the past 40 years, the salaries of CEOs in the United States have increased by 1,300%. In the meantime, worker pay has increased by 18%, one eighth, right? So th this is where we've been and this is where we are. Now, what gives me hope is that I see a lot of people today uh, workers, top managers, top executives, uh, people who are stay-at-home parents, like people with very different backgrounds who have one thing in common. They want to be part of the change because they want to save the planet. They actually also want to create a fairer and more, more democratic society. So that gives me hope. And that's why we wrote that book, because I hope that these people will get to understand power so that they get to understand what they can actually do to make these changes happen because we so desperately need them. If we don't tackle these inequalities, then the situation will become like truly disastrous. But there is the energy, we have the knowledge, so let's get together to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, Tope, this question's for you. Are Nigerian men comfortable with women having more power? And I might expand that and say, are Nigerian women also comfortable with women having more power? So I would say that awareness is growing um, around the issue of um, equality for women and we are having more and more men um, support um, you know the idea that women should have more power they should have equal opportunities and equal access to valuable resources I would say that that, um, that idea is um, is gaining, you know, is, is gaining, and it, 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 it might be it might be a good um, example for for the previous question when when someone was asking how do you, you know, how do, how do you go about it in contexts that are really difficult. I think that's a very good example. You know, at, at the time my brain was going towards like government and the things were done, but again, that's a very good example of the difficult context and how you gain power in that sort of context. And I think that those partnerships are really critical, you know, because right now the, the, the power, you know, with regards to the power dynamics, the men have more power in society and their partnership and buy-in has been absolutely critical to giving more power to women at every level of society, whether that's been in organizations or within families or other systems. Um, for instance, you know, I was I was giving an example of myself and the organization I was working in, um, and I think one of the one of the greatest allies I had was in my my partner and and and, and the executive director Gwen Gashison, um, who would you know always, um, you know, I, it would always um, treat me as an equal partner, and I think that that's what is that's what is gaining, that's what is happening. Women are being seen as an equal partner increasingly in society. Um, and we still have a very long way to go. We still have a very long way to go. You know, like I mentioned, the the society, the, the roots of patriarchy go very deep, and it's in culture, it's in religion, um, and there are women. There are some. There are some women. For instance, there was a time I was um, doing a research around um, how women access and use the web myself, and then I came across a research that had been done in northern Nigeria. And um, in that research, I think about over 80% of women did not want to participate in, in the use of the internet because they equated it with participation in public life, which is restricted by, you know, by religion as they understood it, you know, and they thought it took away their privacy. So sometimes it's even women who don't want this power, you know, so, but we're making some progress, some really good progress. Um, the more education we have, the more enlightenment we're having, um, the more people, you know, the more these ideas are gaining that, um, you know, there's, there's not one preferred gender and men and women are equal and should have equal opportunities and equal access to valuable resources. I think you're muted, Jessica. No, I'm doing it. Sorry, sorry about that. 
<laughs> um, so just to follow, because Tope mentioned technology, um, how has technology and social media specifically changed the concept of power and its struggle with humility as they seem all powerful and incredibly pervasive, almost more powerful than national leaders? Yeah, this is, this is a very good and important question, right? Uh, if we think about technology, as we all know, technology is neither good nor bad. It can be used for the common public good, or it can be used for evil purposes. It's just like power, right? It can be used to pursue noble hands. It can be used to pursue evil ones. Now, what's interesting with digital technologies is that when they emerged, we all had the hope because we had reason to have that hope, right? That this new technology would be the, the great equalizing force, that it, you know, it would give people access to information, to valued resources that they would have never been able to have access to. And, and, and Tope's work shows that if you're very thoughtful, if you really work hard to fight, for example, the digital divide, you can make some of that happen. And, and, and I want to highlight, you know, like the work she's doing, the work that other social entrepreneurs like her are doing. It shows that, yes, technology can be a force for good. But what we've learned through the digital revolution is that, you know what, power has not changed. Power is still the same. The fundamentals of power are still the same. What is it that has changed? What has changed is what we value and who controls access to valued resources. We are in an era in which we greatly value data and access to big data. And we are in an era in which algorithms right, are a critical source of power. So where does that leave us? Well, we are in a world today in which a number of companies, right, private companies, actually have access to all of the personal information about us. They know more about us than we do about ourselves, right? And Shoshana Zuboff in our uh, excellent book on, uh, you know, like surveillance capitalism has actually made that point in a, in a very convincing way with all of the data. So these companies have access to all the information about us. They know what we need and want. Again, think about the fundamentals of power. In addition to that, through control over the algorithms, they can actually influence our behaviors, right? And they can us make, you know, need and want other things that, by the way, they can provide to us most of the time for sale, sometimes not directly for sale, but they still find ways, right, to sell our data to other people without us being aware of it so that they can still make a great deal of money. So we've been using technology basically for profit instead of thinking about how we could be using it for good. And so here we are in a world in which I would say it's unprecedented. The power that these organizations and the people running them have is unprecedented. They know what we need and want. They control access to what we need and want, and they can shape what we need and want. So we have to urgently wake up. And, and again, that takes me to the work that Tope and so many other people and organizations across the world are doing, and increasingly governments are also now realizing that we, we need new legislations. Like take the example of Europe, uh, there is now a whole new legislation in place that's about protecting the, the privacy of the data and making sure that consumers, people keep that control and have that power. I think this is critical and we're going to see changes in the United States and across the world. We also have to be thinking about how we regulate the market and, and we have to be thinking about control over algorithms as well, right? Because what, what the specialists would say is that it's garbage in, garbage out. If you actually feed the algorithm with biased data that actually reproduce the entrenched deep power hierarchies that we were just discussing, then you're going to make decisions now uh, on a, a magnitude that's never heard of that are going to reproduce these existing inequalities. Now, algorithms can also do wonderful things. Like they can help us identify diseases when we couldn't and we can save lives. So again, it's not all a situation where it's all evil or all good. We have to be intentional in intervening so that we create the kind of environment and context in which we together decide on what is it that we value as a society and who should control that access so that it's as fair and democratic as possible. If we don't intervene as citizens, then we'll continue to be abused. Like those in power will just continue to reproduce the system make even more money and increase the inequalities. And, and I think it's, it's in everyone's interest, including those in power that we make that change because societies that are too unequal have a number of characteristics. They become less healthy, less safe for everyone, and they also are less productive. 
So the people at the top have a deep interest in making the change happen as well. Thank you. And this is kind of a follow up to that. Um, can you talk about the different power responsibilities of political leaders, but also about media leaders and educators? When they are determining so much for the public, their responsibilities must be different compared to a private company leader. But the dynamic between their viewers, students, or constituents doesn't necessarily provide as much direct feedback. The, 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 this is this is a very good point. Uh, you know, like with power comes great responsibilities, and uh, the, the question is, you know, like will people are people aware enough of these responsibilities? You, know, you were talking about the media. Uh, the media plays a critical role in shaping what it is that we value, right? And 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 it could play a critical role in in helping change some of what we value so that we can preserve our planet and create a society that's going to be fairer and more democratic. So um, to me here, I want to echo what Tope was talking about earlier. To me, what's critical is what we can each individually do. And that's also why we wrote that book, like what we need to understand about power and what we need to understand if we want to use our power cleanly, wisely, and, and to have a positive impact, right? So there are things that, each of us have to do the personal leadership development we all have to engage in. And we want to make that available to everyone. And that's why we wrote that book. But now beyond that, uh, again, you cannot trust human beings to be able to all the time create the, uh, their, their own checks right, and balances and have their own system. You need the checks and balances at the organizational level, at the societal level. And so I think we need to do two things. We need to make sure that power is shared and we also need to make sure that those in power are held accountable. And I think one way to do that in most of the organizations you've talked about is that instead of concentrating only on one dimension, which is financial value and profit, what we should also value more is the social and environmental impact of the various companies, of the various organizations. And instead of having to pay a penalty because you're actually accounting for the social and environmental impact, we should be in a world in which we are going to celebrate you as a leader because you had the courage to make these changes happen. That's going to require new accountability systems. Again, there is good news. I've been working with a lot of social change makers like Jean Rogers, who created the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board. She's one of the other protagonists in the book. Uh, SASB has developed a whole set of standards to measure the social and environmental performance of companies, right? Including, for example, in the media sector. So th there's a lot we can do to change the system and to hold those in power accountable so that they can deliver on all of those dimensions. And a lot of them want to, but we also need to help them and incentivize them to do it consistently. Jessica, I, I, at least I cannot hear you. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, just one last question before uh, Dean Freeman. <laughs> Have you received pushback on your theory of power from those who argue power is codified into systems, for example, systemic or structural oppression? So I, I thank you for asking this question because I, I, I do not see, you know, like our fundamentals of power as being in opposition with that. On the contrary, when we're seeing that power is about control over access to valued resources, we're also recognizing that then as a result of the distribution of resources, they are deeply entrenched right, structure of, structures of power in place that limit some of us and, and enable others. So, so to me, the fundamentals of power really enable us to better understand the structures of power, the structures of oppression, so that we can then think about what we can do to change them, not only individually, but mostly also collectively as part of the kind of work that Tope has been doing, agitating, innovating, and orchestrating to make change happen. Great. Thank you so much, Julie and Tope and Dean Freeman. I'll turn this back over to you. Thank you. Wow. Well, I don't have anything else to add. I think the panelists have done an excellent job of giving us examples of how power moves through organizations. And I love the um, way that Professor Batalana just summarized that we need to understand power how it's uh, valued, who is in control, so that we can then um, make those changes um, through agitation, innovation, and orchestration. And so um, with that, I guess I will turn it back to our CEO for the final words. Thank you, everyone. 
Oh my goodness, Julie, Tope, and Kimberly, this was such an illuminating conversation. We, I can't wait to order your book. I, I please would like to encourage all of our viewers to go to the chat box on your control panel and you can uh, buy Power for All at Chevalier's Bookstore, which is the largest um, uh, bookstore in, and oldest in um, Los Angeles. So just click on uh, Chevalier's and that link and uh, we all can educate ourselves on how we can all use power more wisely. Thank you all so very much for today. Thank you so much. For our thank viewers, you. we thank you so much. For our viewers, we have some terrific programs coming up next week. On Monday, September 13th, the past, present, and future of U.S. and Afghanistan relations and foreign policy. This is part two of a two-part uh, coverage of Afghanistan. Tuesday, remember that Dan Schneer's politics in the time of coronavirus will be moving to a new time at 5 p.m. On Wednesday, September 15th, the remarkable odyssey of Angela Merkel. And September 23rd, the future of money with Frank Motek, who you will remember from KNBC and now is currently on KABC radio. Please go to our website, sign up today, become a member, please make a donation and stay safe. See you all on Monday. Thank you so much.